Well, greetings, family. This is Bishop Ed. Thank you again so much for carving out time to share with us tonight. Thank you for the access that you've afforded me. Both of them are so valuable in our lives, and we're not going to abuse any of them. So in respect of the time that we have, let's start with a word of prayer. Let's set the atmosphere right. And let me just say thank you to all of my prayer partners that pray before service, during the service, and even after the service. Thank you so very much. But right now, I'm engaging you in the life-transforming discipline of prayer. Let's set our hearts in agreement right now. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, thank you that you're going to help me to teach. You're going to help me to talk concerning the message of grace. God, it's one of those teachings, one of those messages that we always need your presence, but we ask that you would unlock our ears at another dimension tonight, today, that we would hear at another level, Father. I thank you that the audible entrance of your word is going to produce faith on the inside of our lives. Do the same for our eyes, Father. As we peruse scriptures, remove the veil that we may see wondrous things from your word. And then, Lord, cause it to not only settle in our minds, but cause it to settle in our hearts, our spirit, because that's where it takes root and begins to produce fruit. And I thank you for the increase that's going to come. We take authority over the forces of darkness that it will not hinder, it will, it will not hinder nor distract or interfere with the free course of the word. And in advance, Father, we give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. And everybody that agree with that would say amen. Well, we're in the virtual community, so I invite you to invite someone. Call someone, text someone, tag them, however you communicate with them. Invite them to join us as we continue in this month's series that I've entitled Grace, God's DNA. Now, we don't have the luxury tonight of reviewing everything, but our time together, we looked at what DNA is. We've given you some definitions of grace, and hopefully one will apply to you. Perhaps the most common one that most people, when you ask someone, what is grace? They'll probably respond by saying, God's unmerited favor. And they're absolutely correct, but it's so much more than that. So uh, hopefully you're developing a definition or working definition that's applicable to you and to those who you come in contact with. Because what the world needs more than anything else and what we all need is grace, a proper biblical understanding. In fact, that's the objective of the series is so that we will learn what the Bible says about grace, not what religion says about grace or what a person says about grace. What does the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible, have to say about grace? And then not only learn it, but understand it, comprehend it. You know, the great sage himself, Solomon, said, in all you're getting, get understanding. And that's what I want for you to receive, understanding. As a Bible teacher, a pastor, my job is to get it to you, hopefully that you will receive it, comprehend it, and then you can do something with it and make a change in your life. Well, hopefully you've got a Bible with you or a device that has a Bible on it. Let's grab it, hold on to it, repeat this after me. Say, the contents of this book, when received in my heart, will change the contents of my character to conform me to the image of Christ. Amen. I believe it, and I know that you do. Well, our foundational scripture for this month's series is found in the New Testament writings of that talented tan tent maker from Tarshish, the Apostle Paul himself. He writes to the church at Ephesus, and in Ephesians chapter 2, we want to look at verse 8 and verse 9. He says in verse 8, reading from the King James Version, he says, For by grace, God's unmerited favor, God's presence in the power and the power in a person's life that enables them to be who he created them to be and to do what he's called you to do. God's unmerited favor. We're given all these definitions. Grace is God. God is love and, and grace is love in action. All the definitions fits right there. For by grace, you are saved, made whole, made heal. It's the Greek word there, sozo. And we do it through faith and not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. And we determined that the it refers to not only the faith, but also the grace. It's something that God gives. And it's not of works. In other words, something that we can do, because if we do, then we would boast about it. We would say, look at what I've done, and because I've done this, 
This is the result of what's going on. And there is a place for work. There is a place for us to do things. I believe that's the connection. And we'll talk about it maybe the next time before this month. Over. We definitely will address the relationship between grace and faith. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Grace is God giving. Faith is our receiving. I'll say it again. Grace is God's giving. It's what God gives to us. And how we appropriate it, how we receive it, how we're the benefactors of it, it's by faith. And that's what pleases God. When God sees and hears that we know that he's provided something for us and we don't let it lay dormant, but we go after it and you go after it by faith. You don't go after it any other way. You use faith. And the more faith you get, the more ability, the more strength you'll have to receive the provisions of grace. That's a mouthful there, but I hope that you get it. But to today in Bible study, I want to talk to us about the subject matter of getting a grip on uh, what I would call uh, more grace. You know, you ever heard you ever heard somebody say grace, more grace? I have a friend of mine, he's a pastor of a church, and sort of like uh, his buzzword in his church is more grace. Anytime you talk to him, you say somebody or a member of his church, you will always hear them respond by saying more grace. So I want to talk tonight. I want to teach you from the word of God. How do we get more grace? Because God's grace is unlimited. And maybe you're operating at one level of grace and God wants you to operate at another level of grace. And so the question becomes, how do I get more grace? Well, we know how faith comes. At least we should know how faith comes. Faith comes, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But how do I get more grace? I I'm, I'm going to give you five simple points tonight and um, hopefully you'll get them and you'll develop them. And we'll see how we'll get more grace, if you will. So go with me, if you will. First way is, the first thing is, how do we get more grace in our life? We get more grace by faith. It's quite obvious. We get it by faith. Well, go with me in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, excuse me, Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 1 and 2. Listen to what it says. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith, again, we see it again, by faith, into his grace, which in, in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. So the first way that we get access to more of God's grace, we've been saying it for the longest, but I want to put it in a capsule form so that you'll have it, is by faith. The, the, the more faith that you have in your life, the more access you have to God's grace. God's grace is available to all of us. It's unlimited. But some people are operating at different levels of grace. Why? Because of their faith. And so the more faith you get, the more access you have to the grace that God makes available to us. Are you getting that? Let me give you, an, let me give you another one. Well, we just said it, but I'll give it to you again. Ephesians 2 and 8. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So let me say it to you like this. Grace is, is Jesus saying, I provide, because it all comes through Jesus, right? So grace is Jesus saying, I provide. Uh, faith is us saying, I receive. Let me give it to you again. Grace is saying, Jesus provide. Faith is saying, I receive. Grace says, because I love you, I provided for you. Faith says, because you love me, I believe and receive your provisions. Do you understand that? That's very, very important because if not, then, then we're going to get it twisted and we're going to think that God has favorites. And because we see more favor, which is synonymous with grace, we see more favor operating in somebody's life, you might think, well, God loves this person more than he loves that. No, God loves us all equal, but he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So when he sees you using your faith, he will, he will reward you with more accessibility to the grace that's already available to you and I. That's very, very important. So there's an intimacy, there's a closeness between that. Now, 
Let me take you to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. We're just dealing with the first one. We're talking about faith. Faith is, it gives us access to more grace. How do I get more grace? Well, very familiar scripture. Let's, let's look at it in Romans 12, 3. It says, for I say through the grace given to me. There again, I, we cannot get away from the fact that grace is given. Faith receives, but grace is given. And so, so Paul writes again and he says, for though through the grace that was given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's not having, uh, you know, what I call an inflated an inflated perspective of yourself being egotistical. You need to think good of yourself, but don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to because you are what you are by the grace of God. It's not because of anything that you've done. It's because of God's grace. So like we used to say, don't get the big head about it. So he says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. You ought to think highly of yourself, but don't over-exaggerate it is what he's saying here. He says, but to think soberly, you know what soberly means, not intoxicated or under the influence of the, of the popularity and the press of what other people are saying to you. Don't, don't, don't base your life on that type of thing, but be sober, be clear, be vigilant, be sober as God has dealt to every person the measure of faith. So God gave us a measure of faith through which we embrace his grace, first in salvation and then throughout all of our Christian life. We first use our faith for our salvation, but then we use our faith for every other aspect of the grace that he wants to make available to us. Are you with me? Now, let me read something that I wrote down in my notes. I want to make sure that I said it right, so I wrote it down so I can give it to you. You have access to God's grace through faith in him. It's like opening a door. It gives you access to a room, but exercising your faith in God gives you access to his grace. So, you know, the door is there and it'll give you access to the room, but you've got to walk through the door. That's your faith. Remember, James says, faith without works is dead. So I'm working my faith to appropriate the grace that God has given to me. That's very important, but don't confuse it because I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not working for the grace. I'm exercising my faith so I can appropriate the grace that's already been given to me. That's very important. So the first way you increase your, your grace, the first way you get more grace is through faith. Then the second one is what we're doing here tonight. The second way that you get more grace is through the knowledge of God. Look with me in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. He says, grace and peace. You know, let me just pause right here and say, and say something. Grace is connected to everything in the kingdom of God. Not just our salvation, but every other aspect of our life, we see, we see grace there. And so we're talking about grace and faith. Now he says grace and peace. You know, it's one of the most popular salutations that Paul would write in all of his epistles. Many of them he opened up and many of them he concluded the benediction with grace. So grace is, grace is something that we greet people with. And he says here, grace and peace is going to be multiplied. Listen, increase, more faith. Grace and peace will be multiplied. Grace and peace will be increased. Grace and peace will be more to you. Praise the Lord. How's that going to happen? I'm glad you asked. Read on a little further. It's multiplied to you and I in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. The more knowledge you get, listen to me, the more of a propensity you have to operate in the grace that God has provided for us. Here's the truth. You know, Hosea 4, 6, we know what the prophet said. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So a lot of people are destroyed because they're not walking in the unmerited favor of God because they don't have knowledge that's, that it's available. So they think they have to do something. They think they have to work to be accepted. They think they have to work to be loved by God. They think that it's based on their intelligence or their IQ and God's going to love them more if they do a better job at something. Yeah, you'll be appreciated if you do a better job or something, but whether you do something or not, it's not going to affect the way that God loves you. You have to know that God 
God loves you and the knowledge that you have that God loves you, it will inspire you to keep on doing what needs to happen. So the first way we increase in grace is through our faith. The second way is through our knowledge, if you will. And can I tell you this? It's not just, there, there, there are two words that I want to help you with. Bible study, we, we take a little deep dive and we look at some theological terms. It, knowledge is a word, gnosko, okay? And, and, that, and that just means like general knowledge, if you will, to know something. But then there's another word that it's a prefix that you put before gnosko. You put the prefix epi, E-P-I. And so you have epigonosco. And what epigonosco simply means, it means perfect knowledge, accurate knowledge, precise knowledge. I just don't want to have the, the general knowledge just to say that I know. I want to know the integral parts. I want to know what makes it tick. I want to know how does this really operate. I just don't want to know that it operates. I want to know how does it operate. And so the more knowledge we get, the more epigenosis that we get of God, the more it's going to increase the operation of faith in our life. And many Christians just have a general knowledge of God. That's why I love Bible study. That's why I love teaching the Word of God. Get a chance to break it down, you know, rightly dividing it, separating it, so we can look at the, in the integral parts to see how this thing really works. Like a good timepiece. You know, a timepiece, you, you know, you have to have a, a talented watchmaker that can take it apart and, and see the integral parts on how it moves very smoothly and then be able to put it back together again. You can't do that with just general knowledge. You have to have precise knowledge of what I'm talking about. And that's how it operates when we talk about the knowledge and we talk about it being increased, talks about our faith increasing. Let's, let's look at Paul saying something to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 3. Starting at verse 8, he says, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, of whom I've suffered the loss of all things. You know, when I opened up this series and we were talking about the prodigal son, one of the points I made was that grace will allow you to lose everything so that you can have a desire for the right thing. And Paul said right here, listen, all that I've accumulated. I mean, he was, when he talks about scholarly, he was highly educated. You know, he attended the University of Tarsus, if you will, the number one premier place of learning of that day and time. He was there, not to mention he was mentored, tutored by Dr. Gamiel himself. So he had accumulated a lot of things. I mean, he had, his resume was long, but he said here, I count all those things as nothing. He said, I count all the things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. We could say it like this, count it all lost because of the knowledge that I have is not going to give me access to the grace that I need. Did you get what I said? The knowledge that I have is going to give me access to the grace that I need. Everything else, I count it all lost. He said, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. So you see the importance of knowledge. Knowledge is a doorway. It's an access to getting us into the realm of operating in more of God's grace. Now, let me give you the third point. The next thing that will help you and I to get more grace in your life. I know you want more grace. We all want more grace in our life. Increase your faith. Increase your knowledge. Now watch this third one. Turn with me in your Bible to James chapter 4. And the third point for tonight is that you increase in more grace when you learn to walk in humility. Humility is a powerful, powerful discipline that you and I need to have in our lives. Look at what the writer says, James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ himself says in James 4, starting in verse 6. But he gives more grace. There it is. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil. He will flee from you, draw near to God, and he will draw nigh to you or near to you, depending on what translation you have. Listen to what he says here. God resists the proud, those that that want to be arrogant and, 
and want to be so, um, it's, it's, it's not confidence, it's, it's really arrogance when you want to say, look at me, look at what I've done. Let me tell you, you're only able to accomplish what we accomplished by the grace of God. If it hadn't been for the grace of God, none of us would be where we are right now. I know I wouldn't be where I am right now. And I'm thankful for the grace of God. Every day, every day I say, God, I thank you not only for today, but I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. And I pray you incorporate that into your daily prayer life. Thanking God every day, not just for his provisions, but thank God for his grace. And he says, listen, God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. When somebody brings himself under the mighty hand of God and realize if it had not been for the Lord, if God didn't open the door, if God didn't even provide the door for my faith to open, I wouldn't be able to walk through the door. So you can't be prideful. You have to be a person of humility. God gives grace. God gives grace to those who are humble. Peter got a hold of this himself in 1 Peter 5. Go with me to 1 Peter 5, starting in verse number 5. It says, yes, all of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he's going to exalt you. How is he going to exalt you? By allowing more grace to manifest in your life. Remember when we were talking about the DNA of, of God, we talked about the genotype and phenotype. The phenotype is the external phenomena that many people see. And people will recognize the favor of God. They'll recognize the grace of God on your life. And how did you, grace to, how did you get the grace of God? Because you humbled yourself. You put yourself in a place of submitting and humbling to God. You know, when you are a person of humility, you'll submit to the authority. You'll submit one to another. That pleases God, just like faith pleases God. But humility pleases God. And how God rewards your humility is by giving you and I access to more grace in our lives. Are you getting this? So we got to increase our faith. We got to increase our knowledge. We got to increase our willingness to be humble. That's a decision that you and I make. You want more grace? Decide today, I'm going to be an humble person. Decide today, I'm not going to be arrogant. I'm not going to be prideful. Now, other people may consider you arrogant and prideful because they get it confused with being confident. But when you know who you are, you don't, you don't have to walk around begging. You know, you can just rest in who you are and, and favor will open doors for you. It's not something you do. It's unmerited. You don't have to work to open a door. Grace will open door. Grace will give you favor with the right person at the right time. God has everybody already prepared to assist you in your journey as you're fulfilling what he's called you to do because grace is the power of God that empowers you to be who he called you to be and do what he called you to do. But we don't grow in isolation. We grow in community. We grow in connection. That's why being part of a, a right church is so important. Yeah, thank God for the virtual reality, but it's nothing like being under the roof with other people. Why? Because there's an, there's an exchange of the energy there and the grace of God is multiplied even more because we humble ourselves to one another and you see the power of God. So we've got faith, we've got knowledge, we've got humility. Let me give you number four. Here we go. And then boldness. Boldness. Boldness is something. Listen, when you know who you are and that DNA is rising up on the inside of you, you walk with a boldness. You walk with a confidence. You walk with an assurance. Yes, I've got the grace of God on my life and I know I've got the favor of God on my life. But you don't have to go broadcasting it. People will know. People will see. Let's look at what the writer to the Hebrews says to us in Hebrews chapter 4. But, you know, it may seem a little bit unusual, but boldness would be in the same list as humility. But and the two are perfectly compatible. You know, you can be you can be humble and still be bold. Don't think it's either or you can be a person of humility, but still be bold. You can be bold in your humility, if you will. Look at what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter four. Oh, I love this. Watch this. He says. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe 
because this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. Jesus understands your weaknesses. He knows what you're feeling when you're feeling, when you're feeling weak and you feel in, inadequate. We have a high priest who's been touched with the feeling of our infirmities, one translation says. For he faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. Yeah, he faced with everything you and I have been faced with, but yet without sin. Now watch this. So let us come boldly. So knowing that knowledge, it goes back to knowledge again, the knowledge of God's word and God's word produces faith. Humility brings us into that. Now we're stepping into boldness. Look at, look at what it says. So let us come boldly. Why can I come boldly? Based on what I know. Based on what I know, I have a high priest who's been touched with the feelings of my infirmities, knows exactly what I'm going through, feels everything we're going through, but yet without sin. So it allows me to come boldly. Where do I come boldly to? To the throne of our gracious God, to the throne of grace. Do you know that God's throne is a throne of grace? God's throne is a throne of mercy, which are synonymous terms in many, many ways. You know, before it was a, it was a, it was a judgment seat. It was a, it was a throne of judgment where you receive judgment. But because of the blood of Jesus, oh, glory to God, because of the shed blood of Jesus, that which was what once a judgment seat now becomes a mercy seat. And we can come and find mercy. And the Bible says, and find grace. We come to the throne of gracious God where we receive mercy. We'll find grace to help us when we need it the most. You need grace in your life. You need favor in your life. When you've done everything that you know to do and the door still won't open. I mean, you've taken all the tests. You've, you've gone through all the preliminaries. You've done everything and, and done it right to the best of your ability. Not only to the best of your ability, but you know you did it right. And, and, and sometimes the doors don't open. What do we need to open the door? Grace is like that master key. The master key is the key that unlocks every door in the building. Some people have restricted areas that they're only allowed to go into, so they only have access to that particular portion. But when you have the master key, you can go to any place. Why? Because you have access to it. And grace gives us access to everything that Jesus Christ, listen to me, died for at Calvary to make available to you and I. Glory to God. We love him because he's a God of grace and he's made it available to you and I. I hope you're getting this. I hope you're getting the fact that grace. That's why the devil frustrates it so much. That's why he tries to pervert it so much. That's why he tries to come in with counterproductive information that says, you know, you've got to do this in order to get that. You've got to do this. You've got to do it. And so now we're trapped in works. Now we're trapped in in production. We have, we feel we have to produce something in order to get anything. Sure, I believe you need to work. I believe you need to produce things. Sure. But at the same time, that's not how you get anything from God. You get things from God because of the goodness of his heart. So we're talking about how do we get more, more grace. Let's start right, wrapping this up so that you know. How do I get more grace? How do I increase in, in grace? Number one, I increase through my faith, getting more faith. Number two, through the knowledge, the knowledge of who my father is, the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And can I tell you this? Jesus was talking one day and he told some people, the religious people, he said, you search the scriptures because in the scriptures you think you find eternal life. But what the scriptures does, what the word does, the words testify of who I am. The word of God directs us to Jesus. He was the word made flesh, John 1, 14. The word dwelt among us and became flesh. The manifestation of the grace of God is all encumbered in who Jesus Christ is. That's why when you receive him as your savior and call him the Lord of your life, you now have access to the full gamut of the grace of God. You just have to have faith to, so that you can appropriate it. You have to have knowledge to know that it's there. You have to have humility, and then you have to walk in boldness. Are you still here? Look in Acts chapter 4. We're talking about boldness. I have another point, but I want you to see something in Acts chapter 4 as is being descriptive of who the apostles were, which is a type of, of, of individual that you and I need to be. We need to be apostles. We need to be ambassadors for Christ. Look at what it says about the early believers in Acts 4 verse 13. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, if you will. Look at this, verse four, I mean, chapter four of Acts, verse 
13, if you will. Then the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. In other words, they didn't go to the school of Dr. Gamiel. They didn't go to Tarsus. They didn't have the academic pedigree that maybe a Paul had or other people had. So they said these were ordinary men with no special training. So they also recognized them as men that had been with Jesus. In other words, they had been with, with grace. And when you've been walking with grace, people will recognize the grace in your life. They'll recognize that, hey, you didn't go through the training I went through. You didn't go to the school I went to. How, how did you get this position? How are you in the place that you are right now? Listen, you can say very humbly, you know, it's by the grace of God. I know I say all the time, I am what I am. I am who I am by the grace of God. Thank God for the natural abilities that God may have graced me with. But at the same time, I know I'm even the abilities. I got it because it was a gift from him. So everything you have, see it as a gift from God. And my last point of how you increase in grace. I love this one. I call it underlying love. Remember, God is love. You got to walk in love. Underlying love. Listen to this. Ephesians 6, 24 highlights this connection. It says, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ sincerely. That's Ephesians 6, 24. He closes out the epistle talking about grace. He opened it up. When you go back and read Ephesians 1, he opens up talking about grace. And he closes it talking about grace. But in verse 24, he says, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ. The more you love God, the more grace you're going to find yourself operating in. Grace be with all of you who love God with the incorruptible type of love, not the love that man knows about. We're talking about the agape kind of love, the unconditional love. The more unconditional love you walk in, the more grace and favor you're going to find upon yourself. And the thing is, I'm going to show you next week when we come back together again, I'm going to show you how to walk in the abundance of God's grace, the abundance of God's grace. And not just on a vertical scale about what God gives to us, but what we give to somebody else. So you don't want to miss that teaching because you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see something that's going to challenge you, that's going to change your life. But I want you to walk in grace. I want you to walk in more grace, more grace to you. That's my prayer. That's my admonition to you, each of you right now, that you not only walk in favor, but you walk in more favor. You walk in more grace. That God will open even more doors in your life. And you do it through faith. You do it through gaining knowledge. You do it through humility. You do it, you do it through boldness. And then you do it through walking in the under, oh, I love it, the undying love of God. God is love. It never dies. It increases more and more. And the more favor you walk in, the more love you walk in. The more love you walk in, the more favor you walk in. The more grace you walk in. And you'll find that God will expose you to new information. God will expose you to new knowledge. He'll lead you to a book. He'll lead you to a teaching like this. You know, perhaps this is your first time joining. Somebody invited you. You say, I never heard any teaching like, like this before. You know why God let you hear this? So that you can walk in more grace so that you can walk in more favor. And then you'll walk in more humility. Say, God, I'm thankful. Thank you for, listen, whoever invited you, you need to go back and thank them. You say, thank you for inviting me. I heard something today that challenged me that will change my life forever. That's the God that we serve. So I pray that you walk in favor today. I pray you walk in the grace of God. I want to pray with you before we go right now. Father, I pray for each person that you've drawn here by your undying love, that you've drawn here by your mercy, you've drawn here by your grace. Father, I pray that the word of the Lord has fallen on good soil and they will now have a revelation. And then God, they'll be able to walk in the manifestation of that which you reveal to them, of how powerful your grace is. I pray, God, that you remove any distractful information any unscriptural information that they may, have been have, they may have been exposed to, that may have had them confused concerning grace, and take the simplicity of what I'm teaching here and ingrain it on the inside of them. Let them be engrafted with the Word of God. 
because that way it's able to save their very soul and their thinking. I thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, let's receive our offering before we go. And of course, we always want to pray for you. If you do not know Jesus Christ as the one who died for your sin, that you can be reconnected back to the Father, that you'd make that decision right now. I pray there's something going on in the inside of you. You say, I want this Jesus who he's talking about. I want this favor. I want this grace that he's talking about. Well, it all comes with receiving Jesus. If you just pray this prayer with me right now, right where you are, and say, God, that's right, you're talking to God in Jesus' name right now. Jesus, I'm approaching the Father in your name, and I'm asking you to come into my life. I receive you today as my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for restoring me. Thank you for cleansing me. And not only I receive you as my Savior, but I open my mouth. That's right, right where you are. Open your mouth and say, Jesus, I call you the Lord of my life. And by you doing that, you're born again. That's the favor of God. That's the grace of God on your life. If you prayed that prayer, you're born again. Let us know. Drop us a line. The email address is there for you. Send us, send us something. We want to give you some information to help you to build your faith. Remember, build your faith. You'll increase in the grace of God. Build your knowledge. You'll increase in the, in the favor and the grace of God and, and your love and your humility and your boldness. It all comes. I want to invite you, if you're not a member of Harvest, to be a, consider becoming a part of Harvest. Come, you can be in one of our live services, or you can join us the way you're doing it now, virtually because God loves you and we love you too. Listen, it's offering time right now. Let's celebrate. God has given us favor. God has given us grace, but he's also given us seed to sow. And God, I pray now for every person that's getting ready to engage in financial transformation in their life by the sowing of a financial seed, giving back into the kingdom that first gave to us. Thank you for those that are giving their tithe back to the Lord. Now they're going to walk in another realm of revelation and then they're going to sow the seed and it's going to cause manifestation to come. I thank you for all your faithful tithers. Thank you so very much. I cannot say it enough. Thank you for your consistency. Thank you for your faithfulness in your giving. Then I want to challenge others of you. You watch us from time to time, but you've never sown. Why don't you consider today to be the day you're going to step out in faith and you're going to give. I want you to give a generous seed. You know what's generous to you. The Bible says that if you sow generously, you're going to reap generously. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. And I believe this, that you want a generous return. So you sow a generous seed right now. If you're given by text, you text to 910-463-5889. 910-463-5889. Listen, I'd love to hear from you. We'll love to hear from you. Thank you for partnering with us prayerfully and financially. And so until we get back together again, this is Bishop bidding you Godspeed. I want you to stay strong. I want you to stay focused. I want you to stay safe as well. And remember that Jesus loves you and we love you too. God bless. We'll see you next time.